Hello and welcome to this new episode of FST. Let's start with a simple question. Which type of words are more frequent? Words that start with K or those that have K as the third letter? Which do you think is more frequent? First, let's think about words that start with K. Off the top of my head, I can easily come up with kite, kit, keep, kangaroo, king, and many more. Okay, now let's look at words that have K as the third letter. Yeah, ink, and yeah, it's difficult. You'll be lucky if you can think of more than three such words. So yes, it does look like there are many more words that start with K compared to those that have K as the third letter. For most of us, it's not a cakewalk to take up such an unkind task. It's like going to a bakery and asking for a bike or a bikini or an alkaline coke or a tikka masala takeaway. A baker would never acknowledge such awkward asks from a TikTok joker raking in nothing but fake fame. Did you notice what I did there? I just used 16 words that have a K in the third place. In fact, in English language, the frequency of words that have K as the third letter is about two to three times more than that of words that start with the letter K. Although this seems like a trivial example, it actually gives us a deeper understanding of how biased the human decision-making process is. We often use heuristics or mental shortcuts when we make decisions. We humans are far less rational decision makers than we think. What's even worse is that our decisions are not only biased, but are very predictable. The specific bias we used in the K letter problem is what the 2002 Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman and his fellow researchers call availability heuristics or bias. In today's video, we're going to talk about why we suffer from it and how we can try to avoid it in our decision-making process. So, first things first, what is availability bias? In simple terms, it's when we overestimate the likelihood of something just because it's easier to come up with the examples of it. Also, we underestimate the likelihood of something just because the relevant examples are difficult to come to mind. So now, let's look at why we suffer from availability bias. To understand that, let's go back to the question of K words. I asked, which do you think is more frequent? To answer this question accurately, you would need data of all the words that have the letter in the start and those that have the letter in third place. But we don't have this information readily available. So basically, it's a very hard question to answer on the spot. But our brains don't want to give up so easily. So instead of admitting, I don't know, our brains simply change the question and substitute it with a question that goes, how easily can I recall the examples? Now, this is easier to answer. Of course, it's not the same question. And answering it will most probably result in a flawed answer. But that's what our brains do. So whenever you are asked to answer a question of the type, how frequently does something happen or what's the likelihood of something, it's very possible that the question is difficult and your brain can't provide a skilled solution. But intuition still wants to give it a shot. So you come up with a quick answer. Even if the answer is incorrect and even if it is not the answer to the original question, and while doing so, we usually don't even notice that we have substituted the question. So to our minds, the question, how frequent is something, sounds the same as how easily can I recall the examples of something. The more easily the examples of something are available to our brain, the more frequent we think they happen. But what can be the evolutionary reasons for availability bias? How did substituting a difficult question with an easily available but incorrect approximation help us with evolving as a species? One evolutionary reason can be that availability heuristic is less energy consuming. In an environment where you had to be on the alert all the time for your survival, 
making decisions fast would free the brain to do other important things. So, instead of expending energy and resources to get to a 100% correct answer, it was much better to make decisions with rules of thumb that could be followed instinctively. For example, imagine you're a member of a Neolithic tribe. It's winter time and your hunting group needs to decide if they should go and hunt inside the woods or not. The woods are infested with bears. Almost everybody has a family member who has been attacked and in some cases killed by bears. A member reminds the group that bears go into hibernation in winter. But the stories and images of bear attacks come very vividly to everybody's mind in the group. So, availability bias makes your group decide not to go inside the jungle. It's a non-optimal decision. Hibernating bears means you have a much better chance of hunting down a big game inside of the jungle because you are the only alpha predator left. So availability heuristic stops you from making the best decision. But it also decreases your chances of being dead. In caveman times, most information that you stored in your brain was either first-hand experience or passed down to you from somebody who had seen or experienced things first-hand. So, availability heuristic was extremely useful in making decisions quickly and instinctively. In Darwinian terms, it made our species more fit for survival. But cut to today, we are living in a much more complex world compared to our Paleolithic cousins. This complexity means our sources of information are no more first-hand. As we got more urbanized and more connected with TV and internet and eventually the smartphones, we kept losing our individual ability to gather useful information first-hand. We are continuously being bombarded with hundreds if not thousands of messages on our phones day in and day out. We don't gather information from our first-hand experience anymore. We see, hear and absorb things that are made available to us. Attention-grabbing information is the currency of our hyper-connected digital world. And platforms of efficient information sharing such as Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and many other avatars of social media have become so very influential today that they can be used to artificially create a collective availability bias in millions of people within a very short time. Experts call this mechanism availability cascade and it needs its own separate video. So more on this in a future video. We can basically divide the drivers of availability bias into three categories. Permanent availability, temporary availability bias, and personal experiences. Temporary availability bias is things that you get from news. A recent airplane accident can result in many people cancelling their flight reservations. A recent news about shark attack can result in many people cancelling their plans of going to the beach on a Sunday. So that's temporary availability. Permanent availability is what you soak from the social ether. For example, ideas such as celebrities have a lot of divorces or politicians are all corrupt or a certain economic system is worse than all else. All things that we accept to be true without questioning their validity become part of our permanent availability heuristics. And the third driving factor of availability bias is personal experiences. If you personally witnessed something tragic, then that experience will make you believe that that tragic event happens more often. For example, what's the frequency of skin burning accidents from firecrackers? My answer would be highly biased because I personally got my face and hair burned from a near-fatal firecracker accident when I was about four years old. Luckily, I survived the accident, but I still suffer from it because of my personal experience I just shared with you. Availability bias can negatively impact our decision making in three major ways. First, it can lead to misjudgment of risk. Availability bias can lead to an overestimation of rare but dramatic risk and underestimation of more common but less sensational risks such as car accidents or risky mutual funds. On the other hand, we might end up paying too much money for rare events such as airplane crash insurance 
because we overestimate their actual risk. Second, it can lead to flawed information gathering. Availability heuristic can direct our attention to a biased and flawed information gathering process. It can exacerbate confirmation bias where a person actively seeks out information that confirms their beliefs and actively downplays contradictory evidence. For example, if you have to gather information about how frequent the cases of autism in the general population are, social media might make you think vaccines cause autism. Once you recall this incorrect but easily available information, you might start gathering information about how vaccines cause autism. You might end up deciding not to vaccinate your infant baby. This decision can have a very bad health outcome for your baby. It can lead to things like the outbreak of long forgotten killers such as measles of which about 700 such cases have been reported in Texas recently. Third, it can lead to impaired decision making in time pressure situations. The availability heuristic can lead to decisions based on anecdotal evidence or singular experiences rather than on a comprehensive analysis of all relevant information. For example, private universities are notorious for their student recruitment tactics where, among other devices, they target students with limited time offers of scholarships and study loans. Students fall for these scams because availability bias shows them how amazing their life will be after a college degree. The smiling faces of students and 100% placement promises exacerbate the situation. With time pressure and the easily available images, they end up signing up for the useless college degrees and hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loans. Long story short, availability bias can lead to disastrous decision making that can end up ruining financial, health and social outcomes. So what measures can we take to counter availability bias? I've got three recommendations. First, avoid quick decisions as much as possible. Instead, taking a bit more time to verify if these easily available examples are statistically significant or not can greatly help in eliminating availability bias in our decision making. For example, in case of time pressure from private universities, if the students spend time in contacting alumni and asking them about the real job prospects, then there's a high chance they would have avoided the admissions trap. Second, test your decision on 100% contribution criteria. In one of the best known studies on availability bias, spouses were asked, how large was your personal contribution keeping the place tidy as expected, the self-assessed contributions added up to more than 100%. For example, the husband would say they contribute about 40%, but the wife would then say her contribution is 80%. So the total contribution comes out to be 120%. Obviously, availability bias is to blame here. Both spouses remember their own individual efforts and contributions much more clearly than those of the other. Similarly, most people working in teams feel frustrated. Each member feels they have done more than their fair share. Why? Because for each member, it's very easy to remember their own efforts, but not easy at all to remember others' contributions. So, next time you feel frustrated about how your great contributions are not adequately acknowledged by the other members of the team, remember that maybe each member of the team thinks exactly the same as you. Psychologists have found that the mere observation that there is usually more than 100% credit to go around is sometimes sufficient to diffuse the situation. Third, think in terms of the natural frequency of something, not just the probability. Probability is just a prediction, a theoretical value of an event that can or cannot happen. Frequency is the real events that have 100% happened already. So don't make decisions based on probability when you have actual frequency available. For example, consider this fact. The probability of death from measles virus is about 0.1 to 0.2%. Now let's see the same facts in terms of real frequencies. 
Measles virus affects 20 million people every year. In 1980, 2.4 million people died from it. By 2014, global vaccination programs had reduced the number of deaths to 73,000. But in 2019, 207,000 measles deaths were reported mainly because of a decrease in measles vaccinations. For most people, the second way where we talk about the real frequencies is a better guide regarding whether you should get your children vaccinated or not. I really hope these recommendations help you avoid availability bias and become a better decision maker. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, bye bye.